<laughs> about it. So um, now I used to think that um, the most difficult talk is the after dinner speech because I'm not a person. I mean, jokes and me don't really go together. So uh, um, you know, people have had their meal and they've had a few drinks, and uh, then you've got to keep them awake. Um, now I'm realizing that uh, all of you are hanging out for a drink. <laughs> so I mean, to sort of keep your mind off um, the drink um, uh, for half an hour or 40 minutes or something is, is going to be difficult. Um, I am getting, I mean, my, my background is sort of literary studies um, as a first degree, then linguistics for a long time, um, a kind of a sociolinguistics in which power was important, which sort of became critical discourse analysis, then genre studies, and then a move into media studies and culture studies, and of course there you begin to realize that language isn't all there is um, in terms of um, making meaning. Um, so then um, an interest um, in images um, and how they are also culturally formed, not simply naturally there, but culturally shaped. Um, and uh, what that might mean, and of course then everybody knows this and notices it, um, that in uh, everyday communication anywhere, um, image and um, writing go together. You, on uh, websites we have moving, um, we have motion, um, temporally uh, instantiated texts, you have um, moving images, you have speech, you have sound, you have all these things, all of them making meaning. And so the new task I thought was really to understand in that um, much more complex communicational uh, frame, um, what these different modes each did um, in an ensemble. Um, and of course in that, what you begin to realize is that language is a part of a meaningful ensemble. It's, it's a part of the meaning of this ensemble. And if, it, if that's the case, um, you have to ask uh, what kind of part is it? If language is partial in terms of meaning making, it's of a bit of a shock to a long blogocentric tradition, at least in the West, um, then you have uh, to ask in what way is this language partial? Uh, but of course that applies also to image, in what way is this image partial? Um, and sort of thinking about that, more recently I've begun to, I've, I've never, people say, oh, you've lost your interest in, in, in language. Well, I haven't actually lost my interest in language. It's a little bit like sort of being shot um, with a rocket outside of the Earth's atmosphere <coughs> and then looking back and sort of seeing, seeing the Earth actually differently um, to the way you see it when you pour oil down your kitchen sink when you think, yeah, it's just going to disappear and it doesn't matter. And when you sort of see it from up there, you see the boundedness of Earth. And I think when you step outside a linguistic frame, you see the boundedness of language. And I think that's important. Just what can language do um, and what can it not do? And tonight what I want to do is sort of go a step further. For about 10 years or so, I've become uneasy about using the term language. Um, because, um, you know, it doesn't take much thinking uh, that to, to, to realize that speech um, is temporally instantiated, the material of speech is sound, the sort of compression and rarefaction of air, um, and with that we make meaning. Um, in time, with uh, compression and rarefaction of air, with intensity, um, with vari variations in pitch, very, very different to the kind of inscriptions we make on the surface. Um, and to call all these things, um, there's, there's various kinds of uh, means of making meaning by one name, is actually quite surprising. Um, and that's what I want to pursue for a while. So, um, but anyway, it, just to finish that little story, um, in, in all of that uh, sort of uh, change, I've become interested now, sort of seeing maybe I've gained some insights um, about uh, meaning in a way I didn't have before and reflect back now on, um, on writing and on speech and uh, maybe see it differently. And of course, in all that process, I moved from a linguistic framework to a semiotic framework. And the world looks different um, if you're not linguistically framing, but semiotically framing. If the question isn't, what are the linguistic entities, but what resources are there for making meaning? That becomes a different kind of question. Anyway. Um, because I can't do um, because I can't do uh, jokes, um, I have to sort of just do very light, entertaining kind of so for me entertaining. Um, so a little <laughs> bit of etymology and a little bit of history of linguistics, uh, as I call it here, light. And just about the um, the word language. Um, obviously, it um, uh, derives from uh, um, French uh, langue, uh, Latin lingua, the tongue. A major part of what we call the speech apparatus um, is used metaphorically, or some of you would say metonymically, um, to name this thing. Um, and then I, uh, I said something about uh, 1066 and a little bit of all that, uh, which is, you know, those French then came over here and kind of um, 
took over and, um, and colonized this, this country and kind of suppressed one lot of the population and of course named important things and so we have this um, term language because the French came over here. If we didn't have the French coming here, we'd have different kinds of namings. Um, and that's important to, to, to realize too, that these namings are not um, arbitrary, they're not accidents, they are the, the outcome of histories, of social histories, um, and to bear that in mind. Other places name things differently. And then winding forward by <laughs> nearly a thousand years, um, in the 1920s and 30s, um, um, Leonard Bloomfield wrote his um, hugely influential book, The Language, in 19, published in 1933, in which he described the, the relation, or rather he described the domain um, that linguistics should occupy itself with, and he said speech is the proper domain of linguistic inquiry. But fortunately, we have um, an alphabet to transcribe speech um, into a written form, and so therefore, it makes it much easier. We'll look at writing. Yeah? And in that little sleight of hand, speech got neglected really, except for people like phoneticians and phonologists, speech got neglected and language began to stand, or rather writing began to stand for, um, for language and incorporated speech. And of course all of this um, stuff about um, people's uh, speech then kind of being judged ungrammatical is a result of that act because you, you looked at the grammar of writing and the grammar of speech of course is an entirely different thing. So even if you just look at English alone, I think it becomes unrealistic to, to kind of name these things together. They have to be treated as um, um, separate things. The proper um, um, domain of linguistic inquiry, I think, um, might be speech and it might be writing, but as separate kinds of things, semiotically, it begins to be different in any things. Um, and just this issue of naming, in English you do have speech and writing, which are the Germanic terms. Uh, because um, speech is actually etymologically related to Sprache um, and writing is a Germanic term um, so, but you have this superordinate term langage, language uh, so that it clamps these disparate things together and after a while this becomes common sense it becomes naturalized and what is natural you don't see in German as I say Sprache and Schrift and of course another kind of little um, twist of, of, um, of language you have to in German, if you want to talk about um, this distinction, you say uh, Sprache. This is what we, you know, Sprache, Deutsche Sprache. Um, in fact, somebody this morning had uh, Deutsch, Deutsch, Deutsch. Um, um, so you have Gesprochene Sprache, this is a kind of a redundant expression, and Geschriebene Sprache, which is a contradictory expression. <laughs> but, but <laughs> never mind. I mean, this is um, how we use um, um, the resources uh, for naming. But you can see that um, even with closely related languages, um, this is um, very differently handled. Um, and another bit of etymology, writing does come from um, older uh, Germanic forms like Old Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, Old High German. It means something like scratching, um, or scratching things on, on initially on these little thin tablets of, of beech wood, um, runic inscriptions, scratching things, or ripping them, or in some way sort of incise. Um, Whereas shift, um, shift um, actually, uh, and therefore uh, inscription is from um, the Latin um, script. So sometimes it sort of pays to, to look at the history of these things and see wh uh, where we came from and um, why we've got um, to where we are, and to undo the naturalization of uh, naming. And something else which interests me a lot, uh, which I think in the West is sort of very much overlooked, um, um, we overlook script systems. Um, and I don't think, I mean, linguists, of course, have looked at script systems very closely, but they haven't looked so much at the, um, as it were, the script system as a meaning resource. Um, so, um, but also the effect it has, the script system, an alphabetic system, pretends that it is a transcription of speech. Um, and it is sort of, in some languages more, in some languages less. But if you have a system like, um, say for instance, um, a character-based script, and now I'm beginning to be nervous because there are people in here uh, for whom this is kind of um, um, imbibed with, um, um, you know, the stuff that you imbibe as a child. Um, but uh, my contention is that uh, uh, in, a, in a language, um, in a language, uh, in a resource system such as uh, the Chinese have, you have a script system which is quite independent um, from um, the spoken system. And so when the Japanese 
1200 years ago, decided to um, borrow a script system and import it down the country to Japan, um, um, they imported the script system of one culture to their culture when the speech, Japanese as, as a spoken language, is nothing like Chinese. Yeah? So you have two parallel systems. And to this day, I think people um, who learn kanji in Japan can go to mainland China or to Taiwan or somewhere and actually read um, Chinese characters. Of course, a thousand years of different development, social development, will mean that um, the characters might have slightly different meaning, but they're readable. So here you've got a, a writing system which is entirely different um, to the, the spoken um, resource. Yeah? And now the question for me is, is that a better way of thinking about English, uh, or is that an unnatural way of thinking about English? English has been written, as we know, for about 500 years, um, in, a, in a real sense. Before then, um, formal writing was done in French or in Latin. Um, and I want to show you a, a little bit um, of um, Oh, well, that's it here about the use of um, ideographs or characters in Chinese history. I mean, Chinese people have not a particular difficulty. I mean, it is difficult because these things constantly change, but they can read um, uh, characters which occur in a, a text written a thousand years ago. And when we try in English to read um, a text written a thousand years ago, we, unless you have a formal training, in Old English or in Middle English, um, you simply cannot read uh, the form. Um, okay, um, so um, I want to say something very briefly about this uh, issue of ontological and what I've called social implications of scripts. Because if a script um, is, and this is an example I've used a lot, so I apologize to those of you who know it, um, if a script is like the alphabetic script linear, uh, displayed on a line, if it has um, um, simple elements, does it have an ontological um, effect? Does it matter that something is on a line? Uh, does it matter that something consists of a, a relatively small number of simple entities uh, linked? Um, here is um, 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 a Chinese um, uh, um, young person, uh, also three and a half years old, doing this in, in Taiwan. You can see that in each case, uh, this young person or these two young people um, engage with the script system of their culture and attempt to um, deduce for themselves um, what the principles are in this uh, script system here. Simpli simplicity, uh, connection, uh, linearity, um, sequence. And here, not simplicity, but complexity. Um, each um, each uh, character different. Whereas in the alphabetic um, uh, script, um, many of these entities um, repeated, similar. Um, so complexity, um, difference, not um, um, joined um, in sequence. So a very different um, orientation to something. Um, and a bit of a research project um, that I did with a colleague, um, Shami and Kenna, some years ago, when we looked at how um, young people, five, six-year-olds, while they were going to primary school in London, learned the script systems of their home cultures, Arabic um, and, uh, in this case, Hong Kong Chinese, that's Cantonese, but the script system, I suppose, of um, Chinese, um, in Saturday schools. And so here you've got an example of um, uh, Selina, um, five and a half year old, learning to write a character. And I found it just astonishing, A, I didn't realize you learned it on a squared um, uh, sheet, um, but the square is important. Um, in the Western system, the line is important, uh, linearity and sequence. <coughs> in, the, in, the, in this um, script system, the square is important. Um, and when Selena starts the first stroke, she doesn't lean it, rest it on the bottom or lean it on the side, left or right, or attach it to the, to the top. She balances it somewhere because she knows at the end of this um, sequence of 20-odd uh, strokes, um, it's got a balance in the center of a square. Now, I'm asking myself, does it have ontological consequences? That you see the world, or rather you see this thing you produce in terms of the square in which you, you balance things. Now, I've got other examples which I won't show you, uh, which come from Japan, where, where young, well, university <coughs> students in Japan um, produce, as it were, biographies, um, like timelines of their lives, which, which tend to be modular, cent centrally posed, and, and sort of complexes in, in the center of a a framed space, whereas of course um, uh, in the West we think of time as kind of linear, sequential, going from here to there. 
so it's completely different. I think there are profound um, ontological consequences. The social consequence of the character, I think, is that each stroke has to produce each time, or rather the character has to be produced each time with the same sequence of strokes. And what that teaches you without ever being mentioned is that there is a social order which you cannot change. Uh, yeah? Of course, when you write on the line, you also get told that you can't get too high with the kind of um, sort of um, bundle of the uh, whatever it is, of the, of the D or the B or too far below the line. But this question of a, a character of 22 strokes, each time you make it in the same order, that has, a, a, I think, a profound um, um, social um, socializing effect. Okay, so um, I've used um, mo most of my time already, so uh, the rest of the talk will have to be um, much briefer. But you can see what I'm saying, that um, once you begin to have a, a look at these things as a meaning resource, uh, the assumption that you have a single thing called language um, begins to um, kind of disintegrate. So a, a brief history of English um, speech and writing, um, and then um, writing in English in the contemporary landscape of communication, um, something about these contemporary environments, um, and what I think is a, a trend which is from linearity to modularity. Never mind that um, the cultural technology of alphabetic writing is um, in, in some ways linear, there is now, in any case, a move to um, modularity. And then, of course, the question which um, uh, occupies you um, in your professional lives and has occupied uh, everybody today um, what consequences for the teaching and learning of speech and writing, and I think the consequences are different, and of course particularly what consequences in terms of the technologies, um, the digital technologies um, that are the issues for today. So a brief history. I want to show you something from the 16th, uh, 17th century. Um, so writing in the 17th century is about 50 or 100 years old. It isn't settled. It isn't clear what a sentence is. Um, it isn't clear what paragraphs are. It isn't clear what the textual structures of writing are because these are all still um, being experimented with. They're sort of being tried. Um, but the first thing you can say, and I'll show it to you, I think there's a close relation between speech and writing. And speech is the model for writing. The second thing is that both speech and writing are shaped by social factors. And that would be, for me, the underlying sort of assumption for all of this um, inquiry. Um, these things are always shaped by social factors. So when we're talking today about, um, you know, how, what's going on here, I would always ask, first of all, what is going on socially? And um, agency was mentioned in two of the talks, and there's been a fundamental change in agency um, in the last 20 years. Very young people, seven, eight years old, um, assume they have agency. Uh, because um, in a society in which the market dominates, um, choice is the dominant principle of constructing identity, um, and children want to construct their identity through choice, and that many of them have the financial means of doing so. Okay, um, so here is um, um, an example from the 17th century. Um, it is 1653. Um, it's a, a period of great uh, religious and political ferment. Um, the king's um, head has been chopped off about um, 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 five years earlier. Um, religious ferment, pe people write lots of tracts, but the other thing that's happened, technologically speaking, and it relates a bit to what um, we're talking about now, um, the printing press has kind of exploded, or rather the printing press hasn't exploded, but rather the number of printing presses has exploded. In London, over 100 um, publishing houses, that is, printers who also publish stuff. Um, in, a, in a small place, I mean like the medieval city of London, 100 of these things, all of them printing and publishing stuff, um, and here is an uneducated woman, um, a woman called Anna Trapnell, um, and she writes the religious tract. And I want to show what resources she uses to make, um, t for her writing and to make a sentence. Um, so this is the first um, chunk um, of text in the first page of the tract. Um, and now um, I've, I've taken um, this first chunk and analyzed it a little bit, and I'm calling it the social makeup of a 17th century um, sentence. And the first bit I've called the speech of the people mixed with the speech of the preacher. So she says, um, this is two, actually this um, last bit here is two sentences. Okay. Um, the second sentence is quite long. Um, <laughs> uh, here you haven't got all the, the second sentence because, you know, it gets a bit um, sort of repetitive. But um, 
She says, I'm Anna Trapnell, the daughter of William Trapnell, shipwright, who lived in Poplar in Stepney Parish. That, I think, is the speech of the everyday, uh, of the uneducated person. And then, my father and mother, living and dying in the profession of the Lord Jesus, my mother died nine years ago. That, I think, is shifting into, um, let's say, the speech of um, the congregation that she attended, uh, the church. And then the preacher's speech. The last words she uttered on a deathbed were these to the Lord for her daughter. Lord, double thy spirit upon my child. These words she uttered with much eagerness three times and spoke no more. I think that's shifted from the speech of um, the daughter of the shipwright um, in Stepney. Um, then she, I think she goes back to um, that um, other, uh, f form of speech. I was trained up to my book and writing. I've walked in fellowship with the church meeting at All Hallows, where of Mr. John Simpson is a member for a space of about four years. I'm well known to him and that whole society, also to Mr. Greenhill, preacher at Stepney, and most of that society. And it goes on for about another uh, four or five lines like this. One sentence. So the question is, what is the principle of the construction of the sentence? What is the principle of construction for a paragraph? These things are, at the moment, um, very different. The resource that she uses is the speech that she hears. And the resource that she uses, I think, is a sort of a, a notion of cohesion, of, um, of, of or topical kind of cohesion. Anyway, the other person I've looked at is um, John Milton, writing at the same time a tract called Aeroprogotica, which is a tract against censorship. Um, the, the government was uh, trying, um, unlike now, to kind of keep the lid on the uh, discussion and, uh, and debate and uh, proliferation of opinion. Um, and I've, but Milton is universally educated. Um, he's trained in Greek and in Latin. He wrote Greek and Latin verse. He wrote uh, Greek and Latin prose. And he uses that resource. Um, but it's the resource of oratory, of Greek and Latin oratory. He uses that resource to bring into English and kind of shape English in relation to the oratory of um, Greek and Latin. So the first bit I've called measured contrast. So he that can apprehend and consider vice with all her baits and seeming pleasures and yet abstain and yet distinguish and yet prefer that which is truly better, he's a true warfaring Christian. And then I've called the next bit adding negation or negation. These are the sort of rhetorical forms that you learn with Greek and Latin oratory. I cannot place a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised, unbreathed, that never sallies out and sees an adversary, but slinks out of the race where the immortal guards to ran for, not with that dust and heat. And lastly, I've called the next sentence um, balanced opposition. Assuredly, we bring not innocence into the world, we bring impurity much rather. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. So, a, a little sense of um, 17th century um, English written. Um, and where it comes from socially, it comes from the university, from a training in the classics, it comes from the street and from the trade, and it comes from the church in different ways. And I want to use it as a model that um, um, the social is always that which determines um, the representation. Um, but anyway, winding forward by 300 years, now things are settled. Um, this is a front page of the Times. Um, it's not current news. Uh, it's from. 1959. Um, maybe that's a surprise, just to see that from 1959 to now, um, the look of a newspaper has changed to that extent. I mean, this here, in terms of subjectivity, uh, demands concentration, it demands work, it uh, demands um, sustained um, um, time to, to, um, to engage with this. Forty years on, um, in 1999, the times has changed. Um, a, a vast social change um, in which notions of uh, pleasure, entertainment, um, a limit of time so things become shorter, they become more spaced out, the difficulties reduced in terms of um, you know, the visual engagement with it, not necessarily in terms of syntax, um, a social change. The subject, the reading subject of this newspaper is a different reading subject to the reading subject of this newspaper, even though in terms of class. Um, she or he uh, might actually have remained quite the same. And then another example here, an information book for 7 to 11 years old uh, called uh, The Boy Electrician, written first in 1923. Uh, again, I've shown this example a lot, so um, uh, forgive me for that. But um, written to save boys who love to play with electricity, make radios or, or bells for the front door and stuff. 
from electrocuting themselves. So here's an information book for 7 to 10 years old, 11 years old. Um, a little while on, uh, by the 1990s, this, my copy, I, I picked up in a second-hand bookshop in 19, it was published in 1946, so it had a long period of uh, um, uh, relevance. Um, but by the 1990s, uh, this is uh, the look of an information book. It's very different. And of course, um, my focus is on writing, the history of writing, and what has happened to writing. Here, writing is the carrier of the information which needs to be um, conveyed. Now, um, there's a question, which is the carrier of the information that is to be conveyed? Is it image, um, or is it writing? Um, and in that question, has the function of writing in relation to image or the function of writing changed? Or is it still the same as it was in 1923? Um, so this is, and I think what you begin to get now is, I think, a move from the linearity of this page, or this form of writing, to what I'm beginning to call a modularity of this page. Uh, what you're beginning to get is a kind of a specialization of modes, image for that and writing for that, different kinds of functions, different kinds of information um, carried by these. Um, and what I think you're also getting, um, long before um, the emergence of the term uh, Web 2.0 and user-produced content, is actually um, the appearance of um, the requirement for the person who engages with this, I'll no longer call her or him a reader, <laughs> but I don't know what to call that, that person, but somebody who engages with this, um, to actually design this page according to their interest. Because there isn't a linearity that tells you start here and go there. This says, what are you interested in most? Are you interested in the images? Are you interested in the big image? Are you interested in the skeleton? What's your interest? And depending on your interest, you find your way around this page in a different way. You construct a different entity, a different ex textual entity from this. You actually design um, knowledge from um, material which is provided to you, but in a relatively unordered way. So to think that these kinds of things that we're talking about are the consequence of technology alone, I think, is an, is an error. I think these things are more, um, I'm attempting to be controversial, more the consequence of social changes, which allows now um, some of the authority of the author, the power of the author to be transferred to the reader, um, and the reader to make knowledge from a stuff which is being presented to her or to him. So writing in English um, in the early to mid 20th century, I think, is that in formal environments, speech is no longer the model for writing. For educated writers, speech is no longer the model for writing. For lower class speakers, I'm using that to a better term, speech remains the model for writing. And hence, of course, the problem in school, the different cultural capital that uh, different children bring into the school. And secondly, then, speech and writing have become distinct in many aspects of syntax, of textual organization, and in some lexis, and we know that. Um, and really, we do have now, um, I think, sort of parallel strands which still connect between phonology and graphology um, at the point of lexis for certain kinds of syntax, but are in many ways um, distinct, and I want to insist that speech and writing um, continue to be shaped by social factors. I want to show now some, some consequences of this shift from of some of the information being pushed onto um, image. So here is um, a textbook page from 1935, uh, Science for 13-year-olds, boys, because boys grammar, went to grammar school, girls didn't do science really, um, this is for boys. Um, this book was praised by the reviewers for um, being very interesting to boys because of its lavish illustrations. Um, <coughs> but in, in this book, um, all the content that you need to, to know in order to pass exams is actually given to you in writing. Um, so consequently, of course, a certain kind of complexity of syntax is necessary. Um, by 1989, um, it's no longer the case that all the content that you need to know is in the writing. In fact, if you want to know something about circuits and pass the exam on circuits, do not look at the writing because it says nothing about what a circuit is like. Uh, what a circuit is like is now sort of shown in images. Images of two kinds, topological and topographic, that is uh, images which are actually sort of relatively realist and images which are um, abstract, <coughs> theoretically generalized. <coughs> so it's, it's the case that of course you can generalize with image and you can kind of be specific with image just as you can with language. Now, I'm interested in the effect at the moment um, on the sentence. So uh, two sentences or rather two little chunks from each of those. Here is a sentence from the first of 1936 um, and I'll read it and I've marked in bold every verbal element. 
because I think where there's a verbal element, you've actually got um, an embedded clause, yeah, an embedded sentence. When a current is passed with a coil in the direction indicated in the figure, we can show by applying Fleming's left-hand rule that the left-hand side of the coil would tend to move down and the right-hand side to move up. Um, it's um, six clauses, yeah, or, or seven um, uh, uh, junct. Uh, it's in fact seven. Um, joined together. It's a complex syntactic entity, different kinds of integration. Um, this is, I think, what used to characterize scientific writing because you had a, con a complex conceptual thing and you had to have a complex um, syntactic, semiotic thing. By 1989, the sentences have changed. Um, in your first circuit, you used torch valves joined with wires. Two. Modern electrical equipment uses the same basic ideas. One. If you look inside a computer, there are not many torch bulbs or wires. Two, the wires and bulbs have been replaced by electronic devices like transistors, chips, and light emitting diodes. There's an enormous simplification of syntax in this textbook, still for 13 to 14 year olds, as it was in 1936, but this time not for the elite, um, gender elite, uh, that went to grammar school, but this time for all of the population that, will, um, that goes through school at this point. So it's a social factor um, of and in fact, social factors of a complex time. I'm interested to show that these social trends will have effects on what writing is. Yeah? I mean, writing is not something which is stable and stays the same. I think today there was a, um, some debate or discussion of that. Somebody asked a question. Um, somebody from, was it you, from Canada, <laughs> asked about these kind of things. Um, so, um, um, so I think writing now, I'll say from the 1990s um, to 2009, in informal and in many formal environments, writing occurs together with image, with sound, with color, a whole range of modes, each of which carries part of the meaning. Um, the distinctions of formal and informal are shifting and blurry, a social fact about power, um, about um, you know, um, social structures, organizations changing. Writing is shaped by the design of writers in complex environments. Now the writer um, is not just writing, but the writer says, should I put this um, information in an image, or should I put this information in writing, or shall I use color to produce uh, cohesion? Um, and writing is part of a designed ensemble of meaning, shaped by the purposes of a designer in social environments. The social, for me, remains um, crucial. Design as saying, this is what I want to achieve in a rhetorical kind of frame. Um, for this kind of audience, a seven-year-old, what here are the resources I have, and I'm going to use them in this particular way. Writing has become very much one design element um, in a complex um, um, design um, of ensemble. And I think writing now, um, from 2009 onward, the first thing I would say, if you want to know about the future, um, don't think about the future of writing, or don't think about the future of um, semiotic trends. Think about the future of the social. Um, you know, at the moment we have a situation where the state is no longer in control of the market. The state doesn't actually work together with the market. The state has become the servant of the market. I mean, that's been demonstrated sort of very clearly over the last year or so. Um, and so, will this? Will this continue? What kinds of social effects does this have? I mean, what kind of um, subjectivity, what kind of notions of identity are produced by that? Um, generation, I think, has a different effect now than it used to have. Um, I've called generation here the social and semiotic construction of age, just in the, in the way that I, I think you know, we know gender is the social construction of um, sex. Um, and generation, I think, is now um, a significant um, factor in uh, the differentiations around um, um, writing. So here I've got um, a, a website called the Poetry Archive, um, and this is uh, a home page. This is for the likes of me who are used to something nice, linear, and kind of coherent and set out by somebody um, orderly uh, for me. But when we come to um, this, um, this same website and the pages for children, it looks different. Yeah? I think linearity is gone and modularity is dominant. Um, Writing is no longer the dominant mode. Um, writing is there, um, but in a very different form. Um, and when you think now about online environments um, for learning, for learning writing, you have to ask what forms of writing as a cultural technology can you learn from this site? 
And to go to another example like it, I mean, here is a BBC uh, homepage for adults, still sort of ordered and linear. When you go to the children's homepage, um, it's a bit different. Yeah. Now this is this is the online stuff uh, that young people engage with as a matter of course. This is naturalised. Um, writing is there. Um, but writing is a part of a very complex ensemble, and my question is, what sort of writing would you learn from, from materials of this kind? And how prevalent are they now, and how prevalent will they become? And I, I think this age, age difference um, already, I think, uh, when I looked at this in, 19, sorry, in, uh, in 2004, there was much, much more orderliness to the adult side. Um, so I think this is an ongoing movement. Um, um, it is uh, shall I get another five minutes or yeah, um, and then uh, so language, if we uh, keep that term, is partial. Speech and writing are partial means; they're different means. Um, so what are the questions for the learning and teaching of speech and writing in specific social environments? In what ways are um, writing and speech partial? But in any case, um, in, in what are the trends? Um, what, what will writing as a cultural technology be like? What is it like at the moment in an age kind of a profession and um, um, differentiated way? But what will it be like? Now, this, this website here says, tells you something, well, it's one kind of story uh, that you can make from that. Um, writing is a part of a multimodal ensemble in the most banal <coughs> ways. So when I go to work on the bus, um, taking the 91 bus along uh, Seven Sisters Road, um, at the big junction there with Holloway Road, um, there is, when I look out, there's a sign here. It's multimodal. And my question is, um, if it didn't use image, would it work? It's about 150 uh, metres before this busy intersection. Um, how long would the drivers have to, to read the complicated text? Um, would it actually, uh, could it be work working? I think image shows. Image alone is probably not quite sufficient, but image is more important, I think, here than words. Words, image shows, words tell, this is the Morrison's car park, and colour foregrounds and highlights. You, know, you can see it, but you can't see it on this um, slide. There's a kind of a red line around uh, the block at the bottom. On the other side is another um, uh, supermarket. Uh, <laughs> um, again, writing, image, and colour. Um, uh, again, with a, a, you can see the colour even less on this one, but it's a sort of marking how you should drive from where you are. Um, same modes, but a different style, a different colour, a different form of drawing. Um, um, yeah, it's a different aesthetic. Um, and it's a different aesthetic because I do think, um, um, I don't want to impugn anybody's um, kind of taste here, but I do think Morrison's uh, customers just have a different um, aesthetic um, to waitress customers. And I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> where I go shopping. Um, <laughs> but these things, as I was sort of um, showing, have ontological effects, um, what you can do with writing. So if I say in a science lesson, that, or the teacher says, um, tell me something about a cell, and one of the children says, miss, a, a cell has a nucleus, you have a, a particular kind of ontological form here. Um, two entities um, connected by a verbal entity of uh, possession. If she says, well, come out and draw it for me, then um, this person has new questions. Where in the cell is the nucleus? Yep, this doesn't arise with um, speech. It's not a question. It doesn't arise. It can't arise. Um, where, where is the nucleus? Is the nucleus big? Is it a kind of a circle? Is it a dot? Um, so I, I, I drew one uh, uh, for you. I think it's relatively correct. Um, <laughs> I don't take my word for it. Um, what I'm saying is that um, the different representations um, are not neutral in respect um, to what we might call novel. <coughs> They're ontologically um, entirely um, distinct. And this is um, as much the case um, in these banal examples as it is with less banal examples. Um, I might just, um, um, I might just stop here. Um, because um, I think I've, I've either made my point or I haven't. And um, <laughs> this, this leaves at least uh, five minutes for two or three comments. Thank you very Thank much. You very much.